knowledge and wealth in exchange for your soul? Would you be willing to make a pact with the devil? How to make a pact with the devil? This is the University of the Netherlands. In June 2020, two women were stabbed to death in a park in London. It soon transpired that these were no ordinary murders. When the police searched the killer's house, it was found that he had made a pact with the devil. The written contract, which was between a killer and a powerful demon, promised the murder of six women every six months in return for wealth, power and winning the lottery. The killer was apprehended before he could fulfill the terms of the contract, but not soon enough, sadly, to prevent the loss of two lives. Whether or not you believe in the existence of the devil, this man surely does. He seems to believe in it so much that he was willing to come to an arrangement that would benefit both parties, yet harming others. On the basis of this one horrendous event, it would be tempting to conclude that a pact with the devil is the work of a deranged mind. But accounts of demonic pacts have circulated for many hundreds of years. These accounts make clear that the favors bestowed by the devil are significant enough to warrant immoral or criminal behavior. The killings in London, therefore, albeit gruesome, are not an isolated case, but the latest in a long series of real or imagined pacts between human beings and spirits. In my research, I investigate how people of the past used magic to interact with spirits, mainly with angels and demons. For this reason, I studied the handwritten books in which magicians from the 16th and 17th century recorded their rituals and experiments. One thing that puzzles me when I read these old books is that the magicians that wrote them interacted with demons on a regular basis, but they never mentioned pacts. Narratives about magicians, on the other hand, have them summon demons specifically to make pacts. Now, before I address these questions, let's take a closer look at the pact itself. A demonic pact is an agreement between a human being and the devil. To seal the pact, a contract is drawn up either in speaking or in writing. The contract you're looking at here is of such a pact. And don't worry, it's a fake. But it was used as evidence in a witchcraft trial against the French priest Urbain Grandier in 1634. Contracts like these record the favors granted by the devil in return for some kind of payment. When we think of the favors and payments in demonic pacts, we need to keep in mind that the pact emerged in an environment with a strongly polarized religious view of good and evil. In such an environment, humans are torn between the limits that God set for them and the ungodly favors offered by the devil. And these favors are normally out of bounds for humans, but who wouldn't be tempted by the promise of superior knowledge, extreme wealth, magic powers, and the ability to control other people. Since the devil goes out of its way to offer these favors, it's fitting that they require a substantial payment. Yet the devil has no need for human knowledge or material wealth, so the payment has to be something that the devil enjoys, something that drives humans away from God permanently. And there's only one payment that achieves both goals in one goal, namely, to sell one's soul to the devil. The result is eternal damnation in hell, but that may be a price worth paying for the devil's favors in this life. Stories of demonic pacts have been narrated in Christian communities ever since the devil was declared the enemy of God a few thousand years ago. But the most famous instance of a demonic pact occurs in the legend of the scholar Faust, which originated in 16th century Germany. The story of Faust became so popular that it's been retold many times. It also made its way to England, where it was turned to, into a play by the playwright Christopher Marlowe. In Marlowe's version, we learn that Faust knows everything there is to know. Yet instead, yet instead of accepting that he has reached his limit, Faust grows so hungry for more knowledge that he turns to magic. After having consulted the spirit, Faust summons the demon Mephistopheles, who proposes a pact. The pact gives Faust superior knowledge and magic powers in return for his soul. The contract is written up in blood, of course, and Faust enjoys the devil's favors for many years, paying with his soul at the end of his life. The Faust legend has become the blueprint for all demonic pacts for, from the 16th century onwards. Yet even though the devil is today still feared in religious communities worldwide, 
the pact has increasingly become a form of entertainment. A good example is the Halloween special of the animated TV series The Simpsons. In this episode, Homer Simpson sells his soul in return for a donut. The contract stipulates that Homer has to give up his soul as soon as he finishes the donut. He manages to avoid eating the entire donut for a long time, but when he finally eats the last bite, it turns out that the devil cannot lay claim to Homer's soul after all, because it had already been given to his wife Marge. The jarring contrast between the mundane favor and the high price adds to the fun, although for some people, the demonic pact will never be a laughing matter. Laughing matter or deadly serious? The pact with the devil is a myth that has never been substantiated in fact. Yet even as a fiction, the pact must have come from somewhere, and that somewhere, so far as the legend of Faust is concerned, may have been magic. With this in mind, I started rereading the books of magicians who lived around the time that the legend of Faust became popular. Books like this one, for instance, which is full of instructions on how to summon spirits. You can even see what one of these spirits looks like. From previous studies, I had learned that medieval and early modern magicians had constructed intricate rituals to interact with spirits. But did they also summon spirits to make pacts? In order to answer this question, let's examine what the literary magician Faust has in common with real magicians and what sets him apart. It turns out that the way in which Faust summoned the spirit is closely similar to what a real magician would do. In fact, Faust followed exactly the same steps. He had a specific goal in mind. He had a specific spirit in mind. He prepared himself for the summoning. He chose a suitable location. He made a circle and he summoned a spirit to interact with it. Now, these steps are identical to the ones outlined in the books that I study. So, what distinguishes the literary magician Faust from a real magician? The answer to that question is simple. Faust paid for the favors he received and real magicians did not. In the books of magicians, interactions between spirits and humans are not described as exchanges because spirits are not rewarded. At least, that's what I thought upon rereading the magic books, until I came across some scattered references to sacrifices. I read a text that said, to make a spirit appear without any sacrifice. Another text said, if they require a sacrifice, give them none. Yet another text said, mark that no spirit appears without sacrifice. If we ignore the contradictions between these three statements, what is striking is that they all mention the word sacrifice in connection with summoning spirits. My mind immediately conjured up images of demons feasting on souls or human bodies like that of the spirit Dago enjoying its meal. But that is because the word sacrifice sounds so ominous. On second thought, however, sacrifices in magic do not even come close to the price Faust paid when he made his pact with the devil. And that is because sacrifices in magic were not a form of payment, but a means to draw immaterial spirits to our material world. Let's go to the lab to take a closer look at demonic pacts and magic sacrifices. Here's the uh, contract in which I sell my soul to the University of the Netherlands in return for a lecture. And here's the stuff a magician would have used for magic sacrifice. In a summoning ritual, Uring spirits could be done by offering them a sacrifice. Animals are good sacrifices, for instance. Blood, in particular, was effective because it was thought to contain the life force of the creature it was taken from. No wonder, therefore, that blood was used in both pacts and sacrifices. Some magic books recommend the use of animal blood as a special ink to write with. The blood of flying animals was preferred, like bats or uh, birds, because these animals live closer to the spirits of the sky. Some birds, like the lapwing that you see here, even have magic bones in their wings that attract spirits. Other animals that provided good blood were subterranean creatures, such as this mole here, because they live closer to the spirits from hell. Next to animal sacrifices, food and drink could be put outside the magic circle to lure the spirits closer. The drink had to be pure, and the food had to be made pure by sprinkling holy water on it, like so. Yet one of the most effective types of sacrifice was that of incense. As you can see here, the smoke of incense rises up to build a bridge that unites the spirit realm with our world, making it easier for spirits to travel to us. 
These sacrifices may seem odd, and to an outsider they may even look like a form of payment. Even so, the function of magic sacrifice is completely different from the payment in a demonic pact. In a magic summoning ritual, a sacrifice draws immaterial spirits to this world by offering them something tangible. This forces spirits to adopt a material form so that humans can interact with them. In other words, a sacrifice is not a form of payment, but a means to attract spirits and to make them follow the rules of our world. A demonic pact, on the other hand, like mine here, promises a payment that is many times more costly than the blood of a lapwing um, or the smoke of incense. So, if the pact of the literary magician Faust has nothing to do with what real magicians were doing at the time, where may the demonic pact have come from? The answer to this question is surprisingly close to how many of us think today. We tend to divide the world around us into groups, and we locate ourselves in one of those groups, which is, of course, the right one, because we're in it. As a result, another group may become an example of everything that is wrong in the world, particularly if we categorize our world into binaries like good or evil, right or wrong, and so on. To give some examples, there are people who know the world is round versus people who believe it's flat. There are people who know that climate change exists versus people who deny its existence. The list of topics on which we may differ or disagree is endless, but each topic has its own group thinking in which the other is dehumanized or even demonized in some way. Historically speaking, this group thinking also existed and it gave voice to the myth of the pact with the devil. In the early stages of Christianity, stories were told of non-believers who, through magic, made pacts with a Christian devil they didn't believe in. And these non-believers in these stories had to be different from the Christians, and accusing them of magic and demonic pacts underscored their otherness. In the course of time, accusations of magic and demonic pacts were not just leveled against non-believers, but also against the wrong kind of Christians. In the Middle Ages, for instance, the demonic pact was frequently used as an accusation against heretics, so Christians who interpreted their faith wrongly according to Christians who thought they were right. By accusing heretics of practicing magic and making pacts, it was okay to persecute and murder them. An example is the Order of the Knights Templar. After their good services in the Crusades, the Knights Templar had supposedly made a pact with a spirit known as Baphomet. They were declared heretical in the early 14th century, after which they were persecuted and killed. And after the Protestant Reformation in the early modern period, Catholics and Protestants accused each other of practicing magic and making demonic pacts. And since that was not enough, they even invented a common enemy in the form of witches. Many thousands of these so-called witches were tortured and executed because of their supposed allegiance to the devil. It is in the same period that the legend of Faust was invented by strict Protestants in Germany. For these people, Faust was an example of the wrong kind of Christian, one who was learned but not satisfied by the limits that God had set for humans, and who therefore turned to magic to make a demonic pact. And even today, religious communities accuse their enemies of engaging in demonic pacts, perpetuating a form of demonizing and dehumanizing others that has led and still leads to unspeakable misery and suffering. To conclude, how do you make a pact with the devil? According to most sources, you summon a spirit and draw up a contract, preferably written in your own blood, upon which you will enjoy almost unlimited access to knowledge, wealth, power, control and donuts. The price you pay for these favors is eternal damnation by selling your soul. The myth of the demonic pact has no basis in reality, but was designed to show religious people how incredibly evil other people were. In the eyes of the righteous Christian, pagans, heretics, witches, and the wrong kinds of believers made pacts, which made it easier to persecute them. Closer to our time, however, the pact with the devil has become a feature of popular culture for many of us. So, we now resort to other excuses to demonize those we disagree with. Thank you for listening. <laughs>